Good afternoon. Um, I'm Barbara Bodine, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown. Uh, founded in 1978, the Institute brings together diplomats, other practitioners, scholars and students from across and beyond Georgetown University to explore global challenges and the evolving demands of diplomatic statecraft in order to better understand both the nexus of theory and practice and to enhance and expand the appreciation of the critical role of diplomacy in national pol public, economic, and security policy formulation and implementation. The Institute also hosts a number of events and lectures throughout the year, none more prestigious than the JIT Trainer Award for Distinction in the Conduct of Diplomacy. It is my pleasure to, enter to welcome you this afternoon to the 2016 JIT Trainer Lecture and Award. This afternoon, we honor and have the distinct opportunity to learn from the U.S. Secretary of Energy, Ernst Muniz. I'd also like to recognize, and we'll later introduce in more detail, uh, Dean Joel Hellman, the Dean of the School, Mr. Frank Hogan, who is the Chair of the Trainer Endowment Trustees, and his fellow trustees with us this afternoon, Ambassador Tom Pickering, the chair of our Board of Advisors, and many of my members of the board who are with us today, and Mark Giordano, who is the director of the program on science, technology, and international affairs, and the chair in environment in international affairs. I'm delighted with the turnout this afternoon. I look forward to the lecture uh, and to the award, and I would like to start by introducing our dean. Um, Joel Hellman is both a scholar and a practitioner. He brings a very unique and valuable perspective on issues of governance, conflict, and political economy in the conflict and issues of governance, conflict, and the political economy of development. He spent 15 years at the World Bank, was the chief institutional economist, led the engagement with fragile and conflict-affected states as the director of the Center on Conflict Security and Development based in Nairobi, Kenya. He's been the manager of governance and public sector group for the South Asia region in New Delhi and was a development practitioner. Uh, and as a development practitioner, he coordinated the bank's response to broad and deep complex global challenges. He has been political counselor at the European Bank of Reconstruction and, De and Development as well. He holds a PhD in political science from Columbia University and a master's in philosophy from the University of Oxford. Prior to his World Bank career, the practitioner side, as a scholar he also served as a faculty member at Harvard University and in the Department of Political Science at Columbia University. He has brought tremendous vision and enthusiasm and energy to the School of Foreign Service in the eight months he's been here. And I look forward to having him welcome you as part of today's award and lecture event. Dean Hellman. Thank you, Barbara, and welcome everyone to this uh, very, very interesting and exciting event. I'm delighted to be part of it, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to see such a strong turnout. Uh, in particular, I'm, I'm thrilled to welcome our honored guest, the recipient of the 2016 Trainer Award for Distinction in the Conduct of Diplomacy, U.S. Secretary Ernest Moniz. You are the first scientist to receive an award for diplomacy at the School of Foreign Service. I hope you will not be the only scientist uh, to receive an award, but I think it marks a milestone, and I'll talk about it in a, in a, in a, in a minute. I also want to acknowledge um, from the JIT Trainer Award, you know, the guiding force of it, Frank Hogan, thank you very much for that, Ambassador Pickering, who you're going to hear from the moment, the chair of our board at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. The award, which is our most prestigious award for diplomacy, um, is not named for a famous statesman, actually, or an illustrious dean, for example. It was created by the students, um, by the alumni of the school, to honor an administrator of the school, a member of the staff who dedica dedicated his career 
um, to generations of students so they'd have the tools, um, the education and the experience to go out and do great things for others, and to make the world a better place, one alumni, one student um, at a time. The issues that we're going to be hearing about today, the kinds of transnational challenges that we're facing, um, they go beyond the capacity of any single nation state to solve. Um, they, they go beyond any single discipline, um, which would have the expertise to resolve them. Issues such as climate change, energy security, the environment, human security, much less uh, terrorism and nonproliferation. These are the kinds of subjects that demand the rigorous application of science in a multidisciplinary context to achieve successful diplomacy and diplomatic outcomes. So that's why we're so pleased this afternoon to honor and have the opportunity um, to hear from and learn from Energy Secretary Ernst Moniz, who both individually and as the head of the Department of Energy, um, surely a simple title for an extraordinarily complex department, um, really epitomizes the role of science in the service of national interest in the global community. Some of you who are uh, students at the School of Foreign Service, alumni or faculty at the School of Foreign Service, may know that the letters SFS have long assumed to be stand-in for safe from science. Um, now I am actually thrilled to say that our science, technology, and international affairs major is the second largest major in the School of Foreign Service, um, that the enthusiasm of students to pursue science and technology in the intersection of international affairs is a cornerstone of what makes this program great. With the award of the JIT trainer lecture, this, uh, this prestigious award of diplomacy first now going to a scientist, let us say today is the start of SFS being safe for science and not safe from science. Um, and let's acknowledge the extraordinary role that science has played and will continue to play in our quest for peace, broader political, economic integration, and solution to global problems. So with that, I'm very pleased um, for this afternoon's events. I thank the Secretary for joining us, and I'm really looking forward to the proceedings today. Thank you very much. Um, there's many distinguished people in this room that, that deserve recognition, uh, but I do want to particularly recognize uh, Dr. Naomi Muniz, um, who taught for 25 years at Georgetown and was the Director of Portuguese Studies uh, at Georgetown University. And so Dr. Muniz, both, but Dr. Muniz, we're, we're delighted to have you here with the other Dr. Muniz. <laughs> First time we probably ought to think about doing some kind of a joint award or something. Um, this is the JIT Trainer Award, and uh, as the Dean mentioned, this was a, is an award in a lecture series that was established uh, by alumni of the school, by students. And uh, we have with us today Mr. Frank Hogan, who is the chair of the JIT Trainer Endowment. Uh, and I want to give the floor to him to explain who was JIT Trainer and, and what are the, the, what is the roots, what is the purpose of this award. Mr. Hogan was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and he's the chairman of the Overseas Service Corporation, which is a worldwide manufacturer representative, which proudly represents uh, Procter & Gamble, uh, J.M. Smucker, uh, the Hershey Company, these are all really good. Uh, on the other side, Bayer Healthcare, uh, the Snapple Group, as a Snapple addict, I am particularly pleased with that, and other prominent brand name consumer packaged goods. He started off at, at this corporation in the mailroom when he was still a student, and he worked his way up to become the company's second president and chief executive officer. Uh, that is a career path that we can all aspire to, and you know, to be, that is really remarkable. He is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps, and he attended Boston University and then earned his uh, BSS, uh, BSFS cum laude from the Georgetown School. He's been a pioneer in sales to the U.S. military com commissaries and exchanges and government entities. 
He is a member of the Board of Advisors of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy and a very active and supportive member. Thank you. And he's been um, supporting and, and uh, very much a driving force uh, be behind the continuation of the trainer awards. He's the vice, and I would note um, one final point, he is the vice president on the board of directors of the Fisher House, uh, which provides a home away from home for families of military veterans undergoing treatment at VA hospitals. So Frank, we are honored to have you as an alum. I am delighted to have you as a member of my board, and thank you for your chairmanship of this endowment. Mr. Hogan. Barbara, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, Secretary Moniz, Ambassador Pickering, Dean Hellman, Ambassador Bodine, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and warm greetings to all on this glorious spring afternoon. My name is Frank Hogan, as you've heard, School of Foreign Service, 1960, and it's a great honor to speak with you today in behalf of the endowment that makes the Trainer Award possible. The Trainer Award and Lecture Series celebrates excellence in the conduct of diplomacy. It was established by the alumni of the School of Foreign Service as a living memorial to J. Raymond Jitt Trainer. Today's honoree appropriately joins the list of distinguished Trainer Award recipients who have been so recognized over the past 30 years. <clears throat> luminaries all in the pursuit of peace and understanding among nations. The trustees of the Trainer Endowment could not be more delighted to honor Secretary Muniz, who personifies the constructive partnership of science and diplomacy in the 21st century. With you, we look forward to his remarks today very much. When Jit Trader entered Georgetown in 1923 as an eager young freshman, we can be sure that he had no inkling that he would spend the next 33 years at this great learning institution let alone leave such an important legacy. Jid administered the School of Foreign Service for 22 years as secretary. In that capacity, he guided the school with a steady hand and enjoyed the complete confidence of the school's founder, the renowned Father Edmund A. Walsh. However, what made Jit so special was his unwavering focus on his students. They were the family that he and his wife never had. <clears throat> Though he had opportunities to be dean, Jit declined them for fear that it would interfere with his contact with his beloved students. Ready listener, wise counselor, older friend, surrogate parent, father confessor, as well as born educator, all probably explain Jit's interactions and relationship with the charges who who were re returning veterans from World War I, later the financially strapped students of the Depression era, and still later returning veterans from World War II and Korea. JIT was the go-to person when a student needed some extra assistance, some encouragement and confidential advice, perhaps a loan, and even a gentle or not so gentle nudge. When JIT retired a feature article in the Courier, the student magazine of the day, perhaps captured him best with the caption, his door was always open. He was ever approachable and ever giving of himself. On a personal note, I arrived at Georgetown at the very end of Jit's tenure, but was privileged to get to know him quite well in his retirement years. I shall be eternally grateful for his invaluable counsel and support during the early stages of my career. JIT meant so much to the entire, to an entire generation of students that there was a groundswell among the alumni to recognize his legacy in a special way when he died in 1976. What better way indeed to perpetuate his memory than an annual award and lecture series that honors excellence in the conduct of diplomacy? By establishing the Trainer Endowment, the trustees and the School of Foreign Service alumni hope that we have contributed to the spirit and traditions that help make up this great university. Thank you.
all schools should be so fortunate is to have someone like a JIT trainer uh, for so long serving so many. Um, and finally, I'd like to introduce the chair of the Board of Advisors for ISD, um, the Honorable Ambassador Tom Pickering. Uh, he holds the personal rank of career ambassador, uh, the highest rank in the Foreign Service, with a diplomatic career that spanned five decades. He has been ambassador to more countries than many of us have assignments to. Uh, he's been ambassador to the Russian Federation, India, Israel, El Salvador, Nigeria, Jordan, and from 1989 to 1992, he was U.S. ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations. His last assignment with the, was with the Department of State was as Undersecretary for Political Affairs from 1997 through 2000. He has since then served as Senior Vice President at Boeing, and he's currently Vice President at Hills and Company. He holds a bachelor's degree with high honors from Bowdoin College and his master's from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He has a second master's uh, as a Fulbright Scholar while in Melbourne, and his list of languages is as long as his list of assignments. Um, Tom has stayed actively involved, uh, deeply engaged, and continues to provide wise counsel on issues of diplomacy and national security to the U.S. government uh, and to the most junior of officers coming in. And as the chair of our board, he definitely has helped keep ISD going, and I am eternally grateful for his continued advice and assistance. Tom Pickering. Good afternoon to you all, Secretary Moniz and Dr. And Mrs. Moniz, obrigado. It's very nice to have you both here, and it's a special treat for us to be able uh, to change a little bit the structure of this award and get somebody who's a true scientist, not a political scientist, uh, deeply involved in the efforts we have today. Uh, Dean Hellman and Frank Hogan, thank you too very much for being part of this and for all of you particularly those students who've had the courage to bring themselves in out of such wonderful weather and to sit here. Uh, but I hope you will find that this is going to be even more profitable in the warm sun today. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Secretary Moniz. I had the distinct uh, honor of being a colleague of his at the end of the Clinton administration, and he was a pleasure and a joy to work with as a friend and as a colleague and as a friend and as a colleague. I welcome him very much here today. Uh, he's had a very distinguished career, uh, more in many ways responsibilities than even imputed by the tremendous success that he helped to bring about in the negotiations with Iran over the Iranian nuclear agreement. Uh, he brought that intimate and deep knowledge of science that was critical in helping to make the key decisions. And he worked very closely with another graduate uh, of MIT where he was a professor uh, from 1973 and where he headed the Department of Physics from 1991 to 1995. Uh, the, the MIT student with, him he, with whom he worked was Ali Akbar Salehi, uh, at one time uh, head of the Atomic Energy uh, Organization of Iran, and at another time uh, was foreign minister, and so I suppose I should say, John Kerry, watch out for Ernie Moniz. <laughs> but uh, in many ways, it was that particularly useful combination that helped to break through on that very important agreement. But lest I underestimate and in any way at all uh, give you a sense that this is a one-track man, he is a many-track man. Uh, he was a brilliant student from his high school days. Uh, he graduated uh, from Boston College, summa cum laude, with a Bachelor of Science in Physics, uh, a school which I understand John Kerry attended to study the law, so you have another association there. Uh, Secretary Moniz went on to Stanford uh, in theoretical physics to receive his PhD before coming to MIT. His MIT career was graced with many important and significant responsibilities. 
uh, he headed uh, the Department uh, of Physics, uh, as I noted previously, uh, but also helped to be a founding director of an institute that was dealing directly with both energy and the environment, and with an energy and environment initiative at MIT, which, MIT, which is particularly important. Uh, he covered the field, if you like, and I think perhaps no one uh, at the time he was chosen uh, to be the Secretary of Energy was as well qualified, as well informed, uh, and as well equipped as Secretary Moniz to take that job. And his performance in that job, in every sense of the word, I think requites that careful preparation and indeed those important accomplishments. He's worked in the government uh, beginning uh, back in the Clinton administration where he was the Deputy Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And we're going to hear from him on science and diplomacy. And I hope in the question and answer period to follow, in which uh, we very much look forward to student questions, we'll have an opportunity to touch more intimately on the questions of how science and diplomacy fit together. Uh, as Barbara said, uh, but even more perhaps in new and interesting ways to make diplomacy a success, as he has done. Uh, he has also, over the years, received many awards, uh, degrees from other universities, participated in many studies, and uh, I would recommend that you have a quick look, if you haven't already, at his extensive biography uh, in the uh, program sheet, which you have on your chairs today. And I uh, won't spend a lot of time uh, rehearsing those. But I will say, as a final word of introduction, uh, and as an introduction to the presentation of the JIT Trainer Award, that Secretary Moniz's responsibilities uh, cover both all aspects of energy in a civilian uh, capacity, but he is also responsible, and many don't, I think, understand this, for the maintenance and indeed the maintaining up to date the U.S. nuclear deterrent. Uh, he is, in every sense of the word, responsible for protecting us uh, from nuclear dangers. But he has an environmental role as well, which I think is very important because we all know that energy, environment, and climate change are intimately linked, and one set of policies in one area clearly affect what happens in others. And Secretary Moniz is very much charged with those kinds of questions, plays a role in science policy in the United States, but also uh, in our efforts uh, to inhibit the proliferation of nuclear weapons, among many other things. So it's a job that runs the, the gamut from keeping you warm at night in the wintertime and cool in the summer uh, to the questions of keeping us safe uh, from uh, the possible use of nuclear weapons anywhere around the world. And so, Secretary Moniz, it's a real pleasure and honor for, have, for us to have you here today. And I'd like to ask you and Frank Hogan if you would come up. And before we, in fact, listen to you, uh, we would like to present you with a JIT Trainer Award. Uh, and somewhere is a plaque. Okay. And somewhere on that plaque is a dedication. And so I will, if you will come up here beside me, read very briefly. There isn't a dedication. Is there a piece of paper with a dedication? If not, I've just made it. <laughs> just gave it. So you got this without a dedication, <laughs> but with lots of dedication from all of us. So thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Secretary. Maybe we can get a picture. Of this. Okay. Where's the, you want to come out here? Yeah, come out here, because okay. I think we, don't, we have the podium in front of us. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thank you, um, Ambassadors uh, Bodine and Pickering, uh, uh, Dean Hellman, uh, Chairman Hogan. 
Um, uh, I really appreciate the uh, honor of being uh, the trainer award winner, and especially the first scientist, and I uh, do uh, congratulate your taste in choosing a physicist first uh, among, uh, among scientists. Uh, there are physicists, and then there are applied physicists. Uh, but uh, it really is a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, the award really is a, a great honor, but I have to admit I, there is a secondary satisfaction uh, after 30 years of finally being at Georgetown, not as the accompanying spouse. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the, um, obviously the Iran negotiations were mentioned, and I think, uh, uh, I think I'm expected to, uh, to touch upon those, and I, and I will. Uh, I would just note that, uh, that Wendy Sherman uh, was the uh, uh, last uh, trainer awardee in September of two, 2014. Uh, before the Iran agreement uh, was was reached, the so-called JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action. Um, uh, and um, so I think, uh, again, Georgetown has uh, managed to do a before and after uh, on, the, on, on the JCPOA. I'll be returning to what she said in that, in that lecture, which, as usual, was right on, uh, and then uh, bring you up to date, of course, on, uh, on, uh, on where we are. Um, but first, although it's great to be a, a, a scientist uh, uh, in this world of diplomacy, uh, that also suggests that I'm somewhat lost. Um, and so, you know, in coming here, uh, I looked up Merriam-Webster. What's diplomacy, right? And um, it's uh, kind of interesting. Um, uh, first, the art and practice of conducting negotiations between representatives of states. I think that's what we normally think of uh, in terms of, terms of dip uh, diplomacy. But there are also, as is typical, additional definitions which get broader. Uh, the next one uh, was uh, the work of maintaining good relations between the governments of different countries. And I think we often forget that that is kind of the day in and day out work that underpins that first stage of, of, the, of the formal negotiations, uh, and that that work is done by many, uh, not, I mean, diplomats, obviously, but not diplomats. Those of, those of us in government, those of us working with government, are often doing that work. And I'll come back to some, uh, to, to, to examples of that, of relevance in, in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, DUE space. Uh, uh, and then a third definition, even broader, Skill in dealing with others without causing bad feelings. That is the third definition that was quoted. Now, this obviously applies in many other contexts, including encouraging bipartisanship in Congress and all kinds of uh, 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 delicate diplomacy that uh, I do more frequently even than, 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 than Iran negotiations. But I think, again, I, it's actually kind of a hierarchy. I mean, I think in some sense it's that kind of ability and I will come back to this in the Iran negotiations, to develop relationships, uh, to maintain good relations, and then to negotiate agreements, I think is almost kind of a, 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 a direction that, uh, that defines, uh, defines success. The, um, uh, and I will assert here that while the Iran deal uh, is kind of the visible product of those negotiations, uh, DOE, and often, and I'll emphasize this, often through our science establishment, our, our national laboratories, uh, really has participated in diplomacy for a long time in the broader sense of the word. Um, let me say a word about DOE. Uh, Tom uh, mentioned, mentioned uh, uh, some issues. Um, uh, DOE has, it is a department with a some consider a strange collection of, of missions. Uh, it is uh, <clears throat> sometimes we refer to it as the Department of uh, Weapons and Windmills, uh, Quarks and Quagmires, uh, the, uh, because uh, the weapons, as Tom described, are nuclear security responsibilities, and that will be the focus of today's discussion. But I just mentioned windmills is symbolic of the clean energy uh, responsibilities that we have, particularly addressing climate change. Uh, Tom mentioned uh, staying warm at night and cool in the summers, I might add, with low carbon emissions, Tom. Uh, the uh, very important uh, quarks, um, just to finish the advertisement, uh, it's not generally known that 
that Department of Energy is the largest supporter of uh, especially the physical sciences uh, in the United States. Uh, and uh, we operate the key facilities, huge accelerators and neutron sources and light sources that serve over 30,000 uh, uh, scientists uh, each year. Uh, to do their work, over 100 Nobel Prizes uh, uh, coming from there. And the quagmires is, unfortunately, uh, the Cold War left a hell of a mess. Uh, and, uh, and we also have the responsibility for cleaning up there. But two of those missions, I would argue, uh, the nuclear security missions, uh, weapons, nonproliferation, uh, addressing terrorist threats, naval propulsion, uh, and the climate change, clean energy uh, agenda, uh, are really two overarching missions that I think are uh, some of the major issues fa facing uh, the globe, uh, in, in fact. And so those are two of our, of our responsibilities. And as I say, this is all underpinned uh, by a focus on science and technology uh, as providing, uh, providing uh, solutions. But again, today we will, uh, we will focus on, on nuclear security. Uh, and I'm going to start, before turning to Iran, uh, by describing other work uh, I was involved with in the 90s uh, uh, at the Department of Energy uh, that I would say fits that kind of broader definition of, of diplomacy, particularly that of establishing the uh, international relationships that underpin our ability, I think, to make progress, uh, uh, including through, through specific agreements. One, uh, I just refer to the 1990s. Uh, in the nuclear security business, uh, that was, and, and Tom knows this very well, uh, that was the epoch of the unraveling Soviet Union and Russia. Uh, and uh, one of the gravest dangers we have ever faced is the, was the enormous uh, array of weapons and nuclear materials that suddenly had their security paradigm vanish. Uh, the response was one that was successful, including reaching agreements, but it was successful because of that maintenance of relationships over time. Specifically, unknown to many, for decades, our nuclear weapons laboratory scientists had vigorous exchange programs with Russian or Soviet nuclear weapons laboratory scientists. That was not simple, given all the classification, all the security implications. But it was focused on, it was sustained, and then 1992, when things just fell apart, that was the relationship that enabled us, United States in particular, with some other international partners, uh, to, to lock down uh, and to begin a process of eliminating nuclear usable materials and weapons. I would consider that to be kind of certainly the underpinnings of diplomacy uh, um, and uh, extremely important. And, and again, it's a game that everybody can play who has, uh, who has a role in this uh, in support of and in parallel with uh, our diplomatic, diplomatic core. Uh, here, by the way, uh, now if we just make an observation on today, today's relationship with Russia it's got a few challenges. And regrettably, Iran deal actually is an exception. Regrettably, our collaboration on nuclear security issues of mutual interest has significantly declined. And this is something that we are very concerned about, haven't yet seen the way around. But I think another challenge for all of you diplomats in the audience is ra actually to address the issue of how do we address collaboration on very sensitive issues with a country with whom we currently have, frankly, rather strained relationships and do so for our common good uh, in terms of nuclear security. It's a major, major challenge. Uh, I'll just say that uh, uh, former Senator Sam Nunn and, uh, and uh, the Nuclear Threat Initiative are doing uh, a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, wor work on, on, on this, but re it really is a, 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 a diplomatic challenge to get this to a place where uh, we don't have terrible nuclear security surprises because we couldn't work with each other. A second example I'll give of that same epoch 
1992, particularly when, when the Russian economy uh, had some rather serious uh, challenges, uh, is what is arguably the um, greatest completed, at least, nonproliferation program, uh, the program in which 500 tons of Russian high enriched uranium was downblended to fuel for American nuclear power reactors, and the Russians got paid for it at a time when they really needed the resources. Really complicated. Just to give you a scale, that material supplied roughly 10% of American electricity for 20 years, converting Russian weapons material to, to, uh, to fuel. But again, this issue of science and, and diplomacy coming in, reaching that deal was very complicated because of domestic interests. And it took rather, I think, deep knowledge of the system to be able to reach this agreement. Specifically, bringing in all that uranium, what's going to happen to our miners? What's going to happen to those who convert the uranium? What's going to happen to those who make nuclear fuel in the United States? F frankly, it, be it becomes a, a jobs issue, et cetera, domestically. But that's the kind of issue you have to address in shaping a diplomatic solution. The answer was that we would only import a service, the service of enrichment. Now the question comes, how do you import a service? <laughs> so very complicated. The, the essence of it is you import uranium with the service in it and then send back the uranium that didn't have the service, natural uranium. And then everybody's happy except the people who enrich uranium. But that's another story. However, as happens, then you get this technically complex solution you have to, and this is another lesson for the Iran deal, you just have to stay on top of it all the time. These things do not execute themselves. And so indeed in 1999, the deal fell apart over this complexity of having to bring in stuff and send back stuff. It was another, I won't go into it, uh, but another complex negotiation requiring deep understanding of Iranian markets uh, working with international companies, and finally uh, putting it back, uh, back uh, on, uh, uh, on, on track. But another issue, and this is a common issue in the nuclear security diplomatic realm, and often a challenge. Again, these are all elements that will come back in the Iran negotiation. Verification. How do you verify what's going on? In this case, how do we verify that Russia is actually taking uranium from weapons as opposed to just doing some enrichment on the side and saying, okay, here's your fuel? So the answer, again, was in technology uh, and the, the negotiation to be able to apply that technology, specifically our laboratories inventing technologies to monitor the blending streams of weapons uranium with natural uranium and then the output. Not, not trivial, but implemented. Uh, so a technical kind of diplomatic solution. And by the way, that technology is now being used in Iran for verification. So again, I'm just trying to paint a picture. This is a long, long investment of the science and technology intersecting with the diplomacy to look at these nuclear security issues. And finally, before turning to Iran, let me just give an example of what will be a future negotiation. Uh, and this is in the third sense, the broadest sense of the definition of diplomacy, the Comprehensive Pest Ban Treaty. Comprehensive Pest Ban Treaty, eliminating all nuclear tests, atmosphere, underwater, space, and underground, 
went before the Senate in 1999 for ratification. I would argue that ratification, if you're negotiating a treaty, <laughs> you don't just stop when somebody signs it. You have to get it ratified. That's part of the negotiation, basically. It was an incredible thud. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty did not even receive a majority of votes, let alone the requirements for, for a treaty. Two problems. One is that there was a lot of questioning, and frankly, I would say appropriately, as to how are we going to maintain, shrink, but maintain our deterrent without testing? How are we going to do it? And we were in the early stages of establishing a program, but we hadn't gotten there. And secondly, the, a network, a seismic network for detecting globally even low yield explosions was not in place. I would argue that both of those objections have been overcome by technology, incredible technology. The science-based program has now taken us almost a quarter century from a test to a place where we have dramatically reduced the stockpile and our laboratory directors say we know more now about these systems than we would have if we had kept testing. The seismic network, network is complete. I think it's going to be time pretty soon to start the education publicly and with Congress to revisit that and in some sense complete that negotiation with a comprehensive test ban treaty. Anyway, so I've given you those three examples that kind of are prologue to my Iran discussion and I hope what's clear is that deep nuclear science has been and will be part of our nuclear security diplomacy. It's really the only way to succeed. And with that, I will turn to the Iran agreement. Now, I mentioned earlier that Wendy Sherman, in September 2014, stood, I presume, at this podium uh, to receive the trainer award and made remarks about the then ongoing negotiations uh, with Iran. So I'm just going to actually quote first from her, from her remarks uh, in 2014. Thus far, we can say on the positive side that our talks have been serious and that we have identified potential answers to some key questions. However, to get to a comprehensive agreement, we remain far apart on other core issues, including the size and scope of Iran's uranium enrichment capacity. I fully expect in the days ahead that Iran will try to convince the world that on this pivotal matter, the status quo or its equivalent should be acceptable. It is not. If it were, we wouldn't be involved in this difficult and very painstaking negotiation. The world will agree to suspend and then lift sanctions only if Iran takes convincing and verifiable steps to show that its nuclear program is and will remain entirely peaceful. We must be confident that any effort by Tehran to break out of its obligations will be so visible and time-consuming that the attempt would have no chance of success. The ideas we have presented to Iran uphold this standard and are also fair, flexible, and consistent with Iran's civilian nuclear needs and scientific know-how. As should be obvious, a peaceful solution to this issue is highly desirable because compared to any alternative, a diplomatic outcome is more likely to be permanent and less likely to generate new risks. That's the end of the quote from Wendy's remarks a year and a half ago. I think that assessment has stood the test of time. Uh, and we, the United States and our P5 plus one partners, certainly did not accept uh, the status quo. She was also right. The negotiations were difficult and painstaking. Uh, but they succeeded because both sides recognized in February 2015 that the United States and Iran could not break the negotiating impasse without integrating science and diplomacy more deeply than had been the case up to that point and arguably in just about any other negotiation uh, to, that, uh, to that point. The negotiations were fundamentally about a substantial rollback of Iran's nuclear program 
in return for relief from a certain class of sanctions. So on the Iranian side, the nuclear program would have to give up things. Exactly what things was the core of the negotiation? Without having Dr. Salehi, the head of Iran's nuclear program, former foreign minister and vice president of Iran, directly involved, it was proving very difficult uh, as the negotiating team took proposals, their negotiating team took proposals back to him that were deemed technically unacceptable. So in recognition of this core challenge, he and I were put into the negotiations to focus on the nuclear dimensions alongside uh, the foreign ministers, uh, John Kerry and uh, Javad Zarif, uh, who, they, who then focused uh, more exclusively on the political and economic dimensions of the agreement. I do want to note that uh, Tom mentioned that uh, uh, Ali Akbar Salehi uh, was uh, an MIT student, a PhD student, uh, 1977, in nuclear engineering. Um, uh, and that we were there at the same time. I do want to clarify that we did not know each other at that time, uh, but as I'll say, building relationships is so critical in this business, and certainly that shared background, and the fact that his thesis advisor is one of my really good friends, uh, was, was, was important. I might also observe, not so often stated, that there was a third person of some relevance in discussion at MIT at the same time as well, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, of Israel. So, uh, but none of us knew each other uh, and uh, could solve the problem in advance. So, so, so there we go. It was also before the revolution, of course, but uh, anyway. Um, I do want to note again that our, uh, uh, that so I entered the negotiations uh, with Salehi in, in, in early 2015, uh, but that again, our laboratories uh, and some of our sites uh, across the DOE complex were always involved in the negotiation. I mean, one should understand that these negotiations always have strong underpinning scientific technical teams, uh, and the repository of nuclear expertise in this country is largely in our, in our, in our laboratory system. So, so they were involved uh, all the time and will continue to be involved uh, during the current period of implementation and, I mentioned this word earlier, I will return to it, verification, which is critical. So Soleil and I based upon guidance from Presidents Rouhani and Obama, respectively, uh, we rapidly understood what the requirements were going to be. And I think it was very important that we got some clarity on high-level principles very early. One, the United States was going to insist that we call the breakout time, the time it would take Iran to assemble enough nuclear material for one explosive would be at least a year for a significant period of time, compared to a couple of months, which was the, the ground truth at that, at that time. <clears throat> Secondly, we would need an even more extended period of very strong verification measures. And on Iran's side, what they really wanted was an extended period in which while they would accept a reduction in scope and scale, they would continue all of their nuclear activities just at a lower level. So that was the pieces that bounded the problem uh, that we had then to go through uh, myriad trade-offs and excruciating negotiations. Uh, but again, as I said, very importantly, a, a, a relationship of trust was built up at what I would say the scientist to scientist level. This did not in any way, of course, diminish our responsibility to achieve our core objectives, but it was built upon a trust in which we felt what was being discussed was always an honest proposition, and frankly, not the kind of nego negotiation which starts out with wildly different positions at which you're supposed to somehow find a midpoint. And it was really, really kind of interesting uh, along very specific proposals that kind of made sense even though they had to get changed a lot as, as we went along. The basic structure of the deal is also simple. What emerged? What emerged is for 15 years, Iran has a substantial rollback of its nuclear program 
and a verification regi regime in perpetuity with unique features with regard to any other non-proliferation agreement, plus some additional things that I'll come back to. So let me just say, give a few highlights. Until recently, the major focus was on eliminating their plutonium capability, which, which would come from a reactor, a so-called ARAK, that's A-R-A-K, not I-R-A-Q, ARAK reactor that was then under construction. And it would produce more than enough plutonium for a bomb a year. And the discussion was all around who's going to bomb it when. That was what was in the news. Today, the core of that reactor has been filled with cement as a result of the negotiation. Sounds to me like a better outcome. The P5 plus one with China and the United States in the lead will work with Iran now to redesign a new reactor. So they will still get a, re they'll have a reactor. It'll be a heavy water reactor, but it will produce an order of magnitude less plutonium so that it is not uh, a major threat. But by the way, just to make sure, they've also agreed for, for the lifetime of the reactor to send out all of the spent fuel, which has the small amount of plutonium in it. And in addition, a limit on heavy water production, uh, heavy water inventories uh, that they can have. So the plutonium pathway uh, is really gone. But as I said earlier, they have not lost any fundamental capability. They will have a research reactor. They will be able to produce some heavy water as long as they stay within a limit. On uranium, they now operate about 5,000 out of their 19,000 centrifuges. That's the reduction in scale, but limited to only the most primitive design for 10 years. And then there are other things going on. But another major one is they had over 10 tons of low enriched uranium, which had been accumulated in the period of no negotiations. Now they are constrained for 15 years to only 300 kilograms of very low enriched uranium, 3.67% for the aficionados. This is a very tough constraint to operate the system for 15 years at that level. So basically, uh, there are other things as well, including on R&D rollback, which I won't go in, in, into the detail. But the bottom line is, all of these things put together give us a one year or beyond breakout time, which was our, uh, our, our requirement directly from the president. The alternative is they, they would just keep building with, without sanctions relief. That's, that's obviously the trade-off. So that's plutonium, that's uranium. Let me turn to verification, which as I say is a common theme uh, in nuclear security uh, negotiation challenges. Because you know, any time you're dealing with sensitive materials, obviously verification involves some level of intrusive, uh, intrusive activity. So it's, it's just inherently a difficult issue. Very important to this, and again, I won't go through everything, but very important to this is the additional protocol of the IAEA. This is the bedrock of proliferation regimes in the sense that it provides access to sites which the country has not declared. But if we suspect them, we want to go in and look at them. It's the bedrock in many ways. But there's a little detail. There's no time limit. And so we have seen examples where uh, uh, the IAEA wants, wants access, and the country just rolls it out forever. This agreement now has unique measures, including a fixed time limit for Iran to provide access through the additional protocol. That's a big deal. Secondly, there's a procurement channel established. Any controlled item in the nuclear world, they have to go through a UN process to receive. For 20 years, the IAEA will have continuous surveillance of any manufacturer of centrifuge parts. For 25 years, there will be surveillance of the uranium supply chain. None of this is present in any other 
non-proliferation agreement. The good news is 25 years of surveillance of the uranium supply chain. The bad news is you've got to do it for 25 years. Uh, I mean, and this is a serious point, sustaining attention to this is going to be very important uh, for, for the verification. Our Director of National Intelligence, Jim Clapper, uh, has said, look, you can, you can never say 100% certainty that you will find something that is, that's, being co that's covert. But the bar has been raised dramatically for the risk of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, of detection. And finally, I just want to add one other thing. Besides uranium, plutonium, and verification, there's another thing which is present in no other agreement. The Non-Proliferation Treaty says that you should not do nuclear weapons. That's what you commit to. But it does not tell you that you can't do research and development on the activities that lead to a weapon, so-called weaponization activities. This agreement does. For 15 years, Iran can do no work with uranium or plutonium metal, and in perpetuity, they cannot develop certain kinds of neutron sources that are triggers for a nuclear weapon. They cannot engage in hemispherical implosion devices like a nuclear weapon. So there's a whole set of things that they will not, they, they have committed to not doing forever. This is brand new. Indeed, a, a, a number of leading scientists, I would say led by Dick Garwin, you may be known as some of you, uh, wrote a letter to the president after the deal was announced stating that this was not only unique, but that this would ideally become the basis of a broader non-proliferation regime. That is a big lift, but it's exactly the right template for us to go in that, in that direction. So I hope that gives you, again, some idea of, of the nature of the science diplomacy intersection in this. I'll just end with three short observations, general observations. First, there remain it's somewhat muted, but there remain criticisms of the JCPOA. However, I would like you to listen carefully. They are not actually criticisms of the deal. They are criticisms of what the deal is not. It did not stop arms transfers to Hezbollah. It did not solve the Houthi problem. It did not solve the missile problem. That was the choice made years ago, that a manageable negotiation would be attempted. And by the way, it's very similar to what Reagan, President Reagan, did in the 1980s in negotiating arms control separate from all of our other problems with the Soviet Union. Jewish emigration, proxy wars, you name it. So this was the same philosophy, take the existential threat off the table, and then, if anything, double down in addressing the other behaviors uh, that give us so much trouble. Um, the idea of tearing it up we hear a lot of that these months. I've forgotten now who was saying that. Uh, uh, assuming compliance, this would be a really smart move. I mean, for one thing, and I think our ambassadors know, that to have the P5 plus one, even as we and Russia, for example, have such big problems, maintain coherence in this negotiation is a huge deal. The idea that we would unilaterally now tear it up and expect them to follow us into a new sanctions regime is not very credible. And it was the coherence of the sanctions regime that brought Iran to the table. And third, I already said, we do have a challenge of sustaining interest and resources for implementation over many decades. Now, maybe that would be relaxed if Iran's overall behavior were to dramatically change in terms of all these other areas that we have problems with, big problems with. If that happens, then this historic agreement would actually become historical. Check back in a decade. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're going to
going to have a, a brief conversation between probably two of the smartest people in this room. Um, and then we will open it up to questions and comments from this room full of very smart people uh, who are going to be having to take these kinds of issues into the next generation. So, gentlemen, over to you. It says on and off. <laughs> Let me thank you for the address, for your insights into the most important elements of a very important agreement, and for the things that you had to tell us about your responsibilities to the Department of Energy and how they fit into the national security structure. Uh, I have a number of questions, but let me start uh, with Iran. Was there any particular scientific point where you had a, a real breakthrough? Was there something that the rest of them seemed to be missing that you and Ali Akbar Salehi were able to iron out on the technical side that kept the door open and pushed things forward? Well, a huge, uh, a huge part of the trade-offs that really made things come together uh, in ways that um, were technically credible for the Iranian side was the ability to reduce the centrifuges but give but have yet a you know a reasonably significant number running combined with however the very low uranium stockpile and it's that combination uh, that I mean there's a few other things but those are the two central issues which uh, led us to be able to always sustain our breakout time requirement. Now, there's been some complaints about, the, I mean, in fact, we had complaints about using this breakout time, but, but it was accepted. And actually, you might say even, even earlier than what I just described, having that accepted on both sides as, look, this, this, is, how we're gonna, this is how we're going to do it. You know, we need a, we need a clear metric. And once we had that, then we could go into trade-offs in the technical space, including the key one that I, that I, that I just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, but I have to say, verification was another place where it was, you know, pretty tough. You mentioned that uh, Dick Arwin had thought, and I think quite rightly, this is not just a breakthrough agreement with Iran and dealing with our deep concerns about their nuclear program. But it has some now potentially very useful precedents for the longer term. Some of those have to do with obviously the new area of trying to control technologies on the weaponization side. A limit on the output of centrifuges. And obviously clearly a limit on the amount of material that could be rapidly upgraded in the enrichment process to keep the breakout time down. Do these ideas and thoughts uh, have some potential uh, for the longer term future in terms of countries that might want to enrich? And is the idea of multilateral enrichment and the transparency that that might provide some additional useful element here? Well, first of all, Tom, let me say that the, um, uh, the P5 plus one are not of a single mind on whether this should be viewed as a precedent. Um, uh, we can t we can talk numbers, uh, <laughs> but I think you can guess. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, I have to say that I I think uh, as Garwin and others uh, uh, point out, uh, there's a lot to like here in terms of of an expanded regime. I think two areas uh, where uh, I think with work over time, maybe we can get there. Uh, is the time limit on additional protocol responses, um, which makes a big difference. Um, uh, just for these of you know, we have a 24-day uh, time limit in here, and, uh, and with 24 days, we are very confident of our ability to detect the traces of any use of uranium uh, in, in a clandestine mode. Uh, the second is, is the weaponization activities. Um, 
uh, that's that would be a significant uh, step, assuming one has appropriate verification measures. But it's hard to uh, it's really hard to argue about the uh, glories of um, explosively driven neutron sources uh, if you don't have a particular use in mind. <laughs> So, the, so I think those are important. I think in terms of enrichment, uh, look, we we still remain of the, you know, we we'd still rather see obviously um, uh, enrichment not be spreading in in a lot of places, uh, but if it does, uh, um, uh, and by the way, I think one of the things is to emphasize the economics, uh, and uh, I've always advocated uh, something like fuel leasing. Uh, where you, where the country gets a good deal. It's a, another long story, but another interesting. You can do several theses here. Uh, if we could solve the w nuclear waste management problem to everyone's satisfaction, this would be an enormous non-proliferation deal, because then the deal would be fuel leasing. We provide the fresh fuel and we take back the spent fuel. The benefit then to the user is I don't have to worry about nuclear waste. But of course, that's not the world we live in at the moment. Uh, but that would be an enormous step. People do not generally make that association of uh, addressing the nuclear waste issue and having a huge leg up on actually commercial enterprise and nonproliferation. Just a comment. In interestingly enough, the Soviets and the Russians have maintained that policy for any fuel they provide. Uh, would that be something that we could accept? We don't take any of our fuel back. Well, we take back our research reactor fuel, uh, but not, not our power reactor fuel. Um, and um, uh, well, right now we couldn't because we have nothing to do with the uh, spent fuel unless we just put it into dry cask storage, uh, which is not entirely crazy. Uh, I mean, the argument you can use is <laughs> this won't get you very far, I can, I can assure you. But an argument that you could use in a physics seminar uh, is um, that the amount of fuel you would be talking about is almost certainly going to be very small compared to our own stockpile of, 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 sp of spent fuel. So you can argue you get a big nonproliferation benefit for a relatively small increment uh, of, our, of our problem. But but clearly, until we until we uh, have waste management addressed, that just it just n isn't a starter. And uh, by the way, Russia, according to their law as well, for third-party fuel, still a as are the French, still is required to send the fission products back, and so the gain for that for that country is uh, is seriously diminished. Let me now, if I can, uh, take you up to. 30,000 foot uh, level on a broader question. Uh, there's no question at all that science and diplomacy are intimate partners in a great deal of what we do. There's no question at all that at an even higher level, science is one of the key determinants of our safety, security, and prosperity as a country. There are many of the scientists today who are immigrants to this country, and your family came from the Azores. Uh, but we draw on the brain power of a large amount of the world. Uh, and we still have, I suspect, the best graduate school institutions. And you employ 30,000 scientists to do research for you at the Department of Energy. Where do we stand in what is clearly a competition around the world in innovation and science. What's your sense of the prospect for the future for this country? Are we losing our scientific edge? Can we maintain it? What do we need to do if that's the case? Well, I think I think we retain a uh, you know uh, uh, I I still think we retain you know the world's leading science establishment and uh, and certainly uh, when it comes to uh, the kind of entrepreneurial culture that links science to the marketplace, I think we, we remain you know, very, very strong. However, having said that, there is no doubt a lot of others are becoming very strong. Um, um, uh, Australia, China, Europe, you know, all kinds of 
all kinds of places. Uh, actually, Israel. I was just in, I was just in Israel. Uh, tremendous entrepreneurial uh, culture. Um, uh, so, uh, so I think you know it's, it's the old story, uh, as as with this or in other areas. Uh, military technology, you just can't stand still uh, and uh, and and stay ahead. Now, clearly, a lot of the very disturbing uh, comments that we are hearing uh, about. Uh, uh, immigration uh, these days are exactly what will close that gap rapidly. Um, uh, it's um, there are there are alternatives, uh, and certainly uh, something that is in a certain sense. I mean, so aid is bad, like turning away talented people. Then there's something that is mixed. Uh, 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 a lot of uh, our graduate students, uh, international graduate students, now find opportunity to go back to their countries uh, with with you know reasonable environments for for research and teaching, et cetera, et cetera. I mean that's mixed in the sense that well we've lost them, but globally that might be a good development uh, because uh, we also need to have uh, developing societies uh, uh, grow and. Uh, Get get uh, get stronger, but certainly the uh, uh, the extra extraordinarily negative remarks being made today can be can be nothing but terrible for our for our future. So, I'm going to now <clears throat> turn this over to the audience, and I want particularly to have students have the opportunity to address questions to you. They don't often get an opportunity to interview a cabinet officer. And I'd like <clears throat> to make this a special effort. Uh, do we have, yes, do we have microphones for yeah, students? We and uh, we have one right down here. Would you put your hand up if you want to speak? Yeah, got it, good. Thank you. Maybe you could just tell us who you are and what class you're in. Sure. Secretary Moniz, thank you so much. Um, I've actually taken a class with Ambassador Bodine last semester. On diplomacy, and I actually had. How was it? It was great. It was fantastic. <laughs> and funny enough, I actually am also taking uh, Secretary Albright's class, and we had a simulation where I played you yesterday. <laughs> How was it? <laughs> it was grueling. Um, someone close to you was implicated in the Panama Papers. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question actually pertains to. Uh, research that I did last semester, which was really interesting on uh, the Antarctic Treaty System. And for me, it was really interesting to see that in the context of international um, energy security um, as something that kind of brought science and diplomacy together for the first time in the 50s. And I kind of posed the question wondering in the very far future, right, the, the review on environmental protection of the Antarctic is only open for um, revisions again in 2048. But since Iran is so far out as well, and we think about that, I'm just wondering, do you think that um, in international systems like that of cooperation between countries can still stay together in the far future for science for that sake of cooperation and not go into narrow concerns of energy exploration um, as demand keeps growing? Well, the Antarctic in particular, of course, has been, as you implied, a fabulous uh, example of international collaboration in the sense that uh, everybody makes their claims, but everybody ignores them. Uh, and that seems to be a very successful and stable uh, system. Regrettably, uh, the ice sheets may not be quite so stable at the moment uh, with uh, global, uh, uh, global warming. Uh, but look, I think the, um, you know, this may be Pollyannish, but the answer to the question more generally has to be yes, because uh, if I go to my other overarching challenge, climate change, um, you can't get there from here if we don't have all countries fundamentally uh, differentiated, I mean, over time, but all countries pretty much pulling together. That's where I think the, uh, the Paris Agreement, COP21, uh, I think was extraordinarily successful, mapped up against any reasonable expectation for that time. It's not successful in the sense that the commitments made are going to get us to where we want to go. 
but I think it's a, it's a very good start. But the question is, as we come to the review periods and to the need for significantly increased ambition, that's where the issue you pose will kind of the nations hang together uh, is going to get tested, uh, particularly countries at very different parts of the development scale. Uh, one of the, uh, I'll just advertise something else, um, the result of COP21 is, I think, pretty well known, uh, you know, nationally determined contributions in the typically 2025, 2030 timescale, typically reductions in the 25, 30% area uh, would be typical. Um, uh, but at the very beginning of COP, the very first day of COP21, uh, that was when the national leaders were present. And the biggest announcement that day was something called Mission Innovation. 20 countries, including the United States, uh, pledging, I have to say this carefully, to seek to double energy R&D funding uh, over, over a five-year period, together with a parallel multinational investor coalition put together by Bill Gates to put billions of dollars on the table with more patience than is typical, with more risk tolerance than is typical, and with, an, and with a willingness to put billions to the most promising technologies to get them all the way to the end to deployment. And so that's a, an interplay between public and private create more innovation opportunities, more investable opportunities with greater public funding uh, and have the private sector poised to take advantage of that. I raise that in this context because I believe that is going to be a major foundation for the increased ambition we need because that will lead to dramatically reduced costs of the alternative technologies and that's what will permit law emerging economies, for example, to become more, more ambitious. Prime Minister Modi, for example, of India, made that statement explicitly. Let's, let's get the cost down in the next 10 years and I'll be more ambitious. So, so I think that kind of, that's the kind of the work, the teamwork we're gonna to need to see. Absolutely, thank you. On the aisle, thanks. Please tell us who you are. Um, hello, uh, Secretary, my name is uh, my name is Will Hallisey. I'm a senior in the, uh, the college studying economics and government. Um, uh, how, thank you for being here. Uh, I especially liked your appearance on The Daily Show explaining the deal. Always funny. Um, what about Colbert? Uh, yes. Oh, that's what With I Trump. mean. Colbert, oh. yes. Um, so I'm curious. Uh, I think energy policy is very interesting. My grandfather was in science and technology. My dad does that stuff as well, and so does my sister. And so I'm curious about the role of government in research. So uh, private industry is very effective at tackling singular problems. You get um, to people who specialize in technology and who have resources who can tackle specific you know, cancer research or specific um, logistical problems. But pure science has really always been the domain of the government because it has the resources to explore. And so as funding has decreased in the government for this pure kind of research um, that America's always been known for. How do, how do you see, what, what do you think America needs to do in the near future to maintain that innovative edge? I mean, the ambassador talked a little bit about that, but how do we maintain that? And innovation can be measured in so many ways and the way, the number of citations, you know, American scientists receive or the number of patents filed, but how do we maintain that innovative edge in a future that has less funding? How do we engage in that pure scientific research at the same level that we have in the past? Um, first of all, let me uh, say a couple things that um, I would twist a little bit differently than what you said. One is, first of all, uh, I don't consider the metrics of innovation to be you know, citations. Um, uh, a much better metric of innovation and you've got to be patient for it, however, is uh, it's not even what new technologies you invent. It's what new industries you invent. 
And that's a place where the United States has been unmatched. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, government funding science because it's got a lot of money, well, it's got a lot of money, sure, but, uh, but more importantly, um, the government role in the earlier stages of innovation um, uh, is critical because typically no one industry captures the benefits of that research. And so it's much more of a public good uh, and, uh, and will go largely undone. Uh, uh, I mean, they, you know, there are exceptions, but by and large, uh, it would not be a vibrant uh, enterprise. Uh, so uh, we do need to, uh, we do need to um, uh, keep up and, you know, I'll sound like a scientist, have more resources uh, uh, for it. Uh, but, but I think we also need to maintain our system of being very open. Um, uh, the, uh, for example, I mentioned earlier that um, you know, DOE is the largest funder in the physical sciences, largest supporter. Now this is a leading question and I'll bet most of you will guess it right. But who do you think started the Human Genome Project? It's the Department of Energy. Uh, the, uh, and the reason was because at that time in the mid 80s, the skill set and the capability set which involved very large computation, uh, let me call it industrial scale science, et cetera, was not the paradigm for biologists. So that came together, actually it was a meeting at Los Alamos, that uh, our weapons lab, <laughs> which drove that initially. And then about two years later, uh, NIH picked it up and quite appropriately became the leader uh, of it. DOE remained involved, uh, had responsibility for three chromosomes, uh, and, uh, and in fact, we continue with a huge genomics effort, especially applying it to biomass, et cetera. So I, that was just one story, and I'm saying that I think we have to be ready to move across boundaries. Uh, I think we are pretty good at that. Uh, I think we're getting better at it. I think we've got to get even better at it. Uh, that it's these sh intersections that really lead to surprising results. By the way, another one just in biology is uh, we are, uh, we Department of Energy, we are a charter member of the Vice President's Cancer Task Force. Why? Cancer, well, radiation, so we have a history in that, but solving the cancer problem now is recognized increasingly as a big data problem. And going back to our history in nuclear weapons, DOE has always been the leader of pushing the edge of high-performance computing. So we work with the National Cancer Institute in providing these tools to virtual oncology. Uh, so so I, think, I think that's a very important part of it. We've had a more flexible system than in most places. Other places are catching up. We've got to keep, keep pushing in this, in this direction. Thank you. Great question, fascinating answer. Back here in the white shirt at the back. Hi, uh, my name is Theo Montgomery. I'm a sophomore here in the School of Foreign Service studying science, technology, and international affairs. So a great interdisciplinary program. Very thankful to have it, and thank you for being here today. My question to you is um, dealing with climate change, whether it's mitigating, adapting, or educating, it's obviously a huge challenge for all of us. My question to you is, how can Georgetown University contribute to this challenge effectively? What do you recommend we do uh, with our agency? Well, first of all, uh, the program you're in should give you plenty of opportunities to become well informed uh, on, on the subject. And uh, frankly, this is, uh, 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 ultimately a question of uh, the public uh, getting strongly behind, uh, uh, the public and industry getting strongly behind uh, the push to, uh, to address, address climate. The, uh, 
look, I mean, the current discussions going on in the political realm uh, just don't make any sense. I mean, you know, that's, that's all you can say, right? Now, uh, the, uh, uh, certainly at, at the level, at least at the level of providing more than ample reason for taking action. You know, if the corporate risk officer at one of Chairman Hogan's companies uh, says, oh, don't worry, there's only a 97% chance we're going to get screwed, is the word, uh, uh, and it's fine, yeah, you say, you're fired, right? Uh, right. So, uh, so it's kind of... Uh, um, Hard, hard to understand uh, the the discussion, uh, but what's critical is getting out and uh, with the public and with industry, et cetera, and talking about what is a sensible path forward. For example, with industry, uh, I think the public is moving. I mean, uh, recognizes uh, uh, more and more the importance. Certainly, that climate is changing, uh, but uh, but more than that, that we need to we need to ad address this. It, it then doesn't appear at the top of the list for action items. Uh, and that's what you gotta work on. Uh, but industry, I think industry is hungry to get some kind of certainty uh, in a program. Um, it can be a carbon price, uh, uh, whatever, uh, slowly going up, or whatever. But uh, it's, this, it's this crazy uncertainty that I think makes it very, very difficult to make business, business uh, 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 decisions. So I have no better answer than get, it, get, you know, get out there and uh, keep, keep educating. I'm going to take the – well, I'm going to take the prerogatives of the chair. And there is a woman in a green dress who has been very patient. And the mic has gone past her twice. If – way. Down, 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 there. Okay. At least 25% should be from the women. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I said at least. At least. Well, we're getting one out of four. So. Um, hi, my name is Rachel Rogers, and I am a senior studying international politics in the School of Foreign Service. Uh, you answered a previous question and spoke very articulately and eloquently about the need to lower the price of these alternative technologies so that emerging economies can use them. That said, I think of, that there are a lot of emerging economies who are very reliant on oil. For example, in September of 2015, when Royal Dutch Shell announced that they were pulling out of the Arctic, that caused a lot of frustration in Greenland, who, because they are so reliant on that in terms of their economy saw that as a major roadblock in being able to achieve eventual independence from Denmark. So following up on the earlier question, how can use of these alternative fuel and alternative technologies be encouraged in economies that are extremely reliant on oil and aren't necessarily stable enough to be able to support complete infrastructural change? Well, um, first of all, it's an issue uh, in developed economies and in developing economies. Uh, um, and maybe I'll say a word about the United States at, uh, in, in a second. Um, the, uh, I think you are seeing that uh, oil-dependent economies uh, are beginning to make uh, strong moves on developing alternatives uh, internally. Uh, the um, Saudi Arabia certainly has made a big shift towards well, natural gas for electricity. In fact, one of the things I would say is that um, uh, in many cases, a first move towards getting off of oil in electricity um, uh, is, is a great step because there are many alternatives. Uh, if you can reach natural gas, great, but renewables, uh, remote renewables and, uh, and batteries uh, together are, even though batteries are expensive, uh, solar costs have come way down, let's say, but, uh, but still, when you, most of a, a community that is, that is very isolated uh, and depends upon diesel being trucked in is horribly expensive. And 
solar and batteries right now, again, you know, it depends where you are in terms of climate, obviously, but uh, can be very, very competitive. Um, another issue, by the way, which is not quite the same issue you raised, but let me just note it as well, is that, uh, as we know, there are still over a billion people with essentially no electricity at all. And for them, uh, very often, a very small amount of electricity, tens of watts, can be life-changing. Uh, that's, again, some, something where you can combine solar and a battery and an LED lighting, which requires very little power, can be completely changing. You know, literally, the things like, you know, kids doing homework, you know, at, at night, et cetera. So, uh, so I think there's a lot of, lot of technology there. On the, on the uh, oil side, uh, again, getting remote places in developing countries or in the United States, like Alaska, uh, uh, to, to shed the need for diesel fuel coming in is really important. Often these are idiosyncratic solutions. For example, in Alaska, we just had a very successful um, project where uh, remote village, but along a river, we put a hydrokinetic turbine in the river and it's working very well and not harming the fish. Uh, and so that's an example of providing megawatts uh, to a remote village and Boy, that's a huge saver in, 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 in money. Let me just make a comment on the United States, uh, where you know our oil production has gone down a little bit, uh, a few hundred thousand barrels a day with the lower, the lower prices. Uh, but still, that doesn't change the big picture, where our production has gone up by four million barrels a day, uh, mainly from, from uh, shale oil. One of the questions always asked is how can we, you know, kind of feel comfortable with increasing this oil production and still pursue a low carbon future? Well, the answer for now, at least, is pretty simple. We still import 7 million barrels a day of crude oil. So our increased production has really gone into dramatically decreasing imports I should say we I import 7 million crude oil, but we're now exporting 4.5 million barrels a day of products. So the net has gone way, way down. Still, we are an importer. So we have not taken our eyes in the least off the ball of increasing vehicle efficiency dramatically, of continuing to work on the next generation advanced biofuels, which are still too expensive, and third, to promote electrification of, of, of vehicles. So uh, we, are, we are working as hard as we can to diminish oil dependence even as we decrease our balance of, imbalance of payments with, with, with imports. So I think it's important to have the whole picture. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank I'm, you, I'm, Mr. Secretary, I'm, very much. Thank you very Robert. much. I was going to say thank you, thank you, Ambassador Pickering, and thank you, Secretary Moniz. Thank you all for coming to this year's award and lecture. Uh, we have covered economics, the Cold War, history, politics, um, weapons, windmills, corks, and quagmires, and a few other things. This has been a tremendous afternoon, and I truly want to thank you, Secretary. Uh, for joining us today, and thank you all.